Political Capital is brought to you by Uber Canada. Learn more at uber.com slash flexibility works. Check podcasts. Hey everyone, and welcome to Political Capital, your source for all the latest in BC politics. We are back after an Easter break. I'm your host, Rob Shaw, returning to the Czech News World Headquarters in Victoria. We're going to talk about the carbon tax. We're going to talk about drug use inside BC's hospitals and decriminalization and Rustad mania running wild, the BC conservative surge in BC politics. So make sure you subscribe to our podcast as well for additional topics. Bringing in the panel, you know them, you love them. Allie Blades, Jeff Ferrier, and Kill Salem. Thank you all for being here to break down our very first topic. A couple weeks off, carbon tax has just basically kind of exploded into a continued national story and a headache for the BC government. Conservative leader Pierre Polyevre has been in BC all week, whipping up rallies, thousands of people at the Axe the Tax rallies. Premier David Eby now finds himself the only premier in Canada defending the carbon tax because Manitoba's NDP Premier, Wab Kanu, he had a budget this week that charted a plan to fight climate change while getting an exemption, he hopes, from the carbon tax during the affordability crisis. So that's where David Eby is alone. Gas prices are going up. I want to start with the first question. Ali, why don't we start with you? Can the NDP hold this defense of the carbon tax? Are they going to have to pivot? I don't think that they have to pivot. One, they have the benefit of a strong lead. Um, they are naturally assumed to form government again. Uh, they can get away with it. But I, I've said this before, and I think this is going to be true leading into the election in that they, they can't afford to go back because this will be their environmental vote that they could then get from the green vote uh, potential. Potentially, what's going to end up happening is those that think that throwing away their vote with the Greens uh, on this issue, they could then place that vote with the NDP. So I think it's very strategic to pick up more of that left side of the flank when, it, when we come to, to voting intentions. Um, and, and I think that uh, because he has that luxury, that like he could really get away with it. Like, I don't think it's really going to hurt David Eby and the BC NDP. Um, mm. Meanwhile, um, on the other side, they're just fighting for who has more prominence on axing the tax better when it comes to the BC United and the BC Conservatives. Who's got a better axe? Who's the better mm. axe person, basically? Yeah, who makes the sharper axe attack? Uh, Kill Salem, what do you think about the carbon tax? Is it Kind of on its last legs given i mean there's like eight premiers now against it uh, the prime minister in waiting according to the polls it's just bc new democrats kind of trying to defend this thing uh, what do you what do you think its future is going to be here in the province i think the future of the carbon tax in bc is probably relatively safe um, especially if the bc ndp do get re-elected um, I, you know, this whole issue really became a snowball because of the federal liberal government when they started creating these carve outs and then turned this into a highly politicized policy, whereas before it kind of had a bit more, um, you know, support, broadly speaking. Um, the challenge and the opportunity for the BCNDP is, although the BC carbon tax does provide a lot of rebates to certain income brackets within BC, and you do see cash transfers going back out to help low income families, doesn't really hit the middle class as much as it, it probably needs to from an electoral standpoint. The, the big challenge, and I think where the uh, provincial government probably will go, is all of their big climate policies, uh, all of their big climate readiness and emergency management, all of that stuff, all the things that they're going to have to spend uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on firefighters, landslides, um, so forth. They need to pay for that. And the carbon tax actually does bring in a significant revenue to pay for those things. So that I think from a fiscal standpoint, they're probably going to stand by it because they can point to and say, you know, heat waves come and they're pr providing resources to communities to address heat waves. They say, well, the carbon tax is paying for those things. And that's probably how they're going to be able to defend it. But the weather, this political storm um, that's coming from the federal conservative party and now, you know, the, the two right of center parties. Do you think Kill Salem, like, is it possible if we have a bad wildfire summer and a bad drought summer, that we're talking about the carbon tax in the flip way in September, that people are concerned about climate change and the practical impacts, and they're actually back from worrying about the affordability of it to wanting more action on, on that front? Could we 
Could this totally flip before the next election? It's totally possible. We've seen this in other provinces. You know, there was a few years ago when Quebec had massive heat waves and they had massive deaths. So, you know, BC also went through this as well. And you saw uh, polling where climate started becoming a top tier issue in Quebec. And you had, you know, multi-party support for different kinds of climate action in Quebec relative to sort of conservative parties elsewhere. Um, so it can shift. Um, you know, the big challenge, of course, though, and this has been pointed out by others, is 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 the carbon tax doing what it was intended, which is to shift behavior and to reduce emissions? And it hasn't really done that because the truth of the matter is, and, you know, the BC's Climate Solutions Council has modeled this, provincial government has modeled federal government, the 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 way in which you have to increase the carbon tax for it to actually start shifting behavior is high and their government's trying to slowly ramp it up to that level. They're not going to turn that on overnight because that would be a hard, hard hit for people. But the reality is the carbon tax is actually not high enough for it to have the intended outcome. But politicians also don't want to raise it too high because of the blowback that that might cause. Mm -hmm. Jeff, that paradox is a, is a tough one for a political party to navigate. Well, I, I think you're seeing some progress. I think you're seeing it particularly on zero emission vehicles. BC has the uh, 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 most, the highest uptake of, of, of those by a, a wide factor over uh, other jurisdictions in Canada. And that's because of the carbon tax. We've had it for longer. The, our gas prices are, are high and people are making uh, market-based choices to, that are uh, helping uh, with the environment. I think it's uh, the issue is an, an opportunity and challenge for, for both sides. And I think we've talked about the opportunities, but uh, for the opposition, I think the challenge is uh, uh, filling a hall in April with people uh, shaking their fists uh, and, and chanting slogans. It's a lot easier to do that in April and the spring than it will be in September in the election when we've had wildfires and drought and uh, uh, hardship. Uh, uh, you look at all of the forecasts for what's going to be coming uh, uh, this summer. You look at the riverbeds that have dried up because of no snow and no precipitation in the interior in particular. And this is going to be a tough, tough summer for British Columbia. So this will be a tough issue. I don't think it's going to shift anyone one way or the other, but it will heighten the resolve of people who care about climate, who care about the environment to get out and vote for a, a positive choice. I think the, the, the challenge for government is that you fill up the gas tank uh, week after week after week. You see the prices week after week after week. Uh, tax season comes around once a year. And even if you're getting to claim tax credits, the last time uh, I did my uh, income taxes, it was not a joyful experience. Most years, it's a pain in, it's a pain in the rear. Next topic is a, uh, actually kind of came out of nowhere, but apparently has been going on for quite a while now, which is a linkage uh, between decriminalization and drug use inside BC's hospitals. There was a memo that came out from Northern Health uh, instructing nurses not to seize people's drugs or stop them from using inside hospital rooms or even stop people coming into the hospital with drugs or even take weapons uh, away. The government said that it's poorly worded. You can't do drugs or have weapons in hospitals. But nurses said, actually, it's happening every single day. So we've suddenly added another layer of complexity to the, the lens we're viewing decriminalization and the ongoing debate right now. Ali, what do you make of that? I think this is our new needles in the park, right? We spent a good chunk of the session talking about uh, getting rid of people using in parks, in places where children are, in front of businesses. Uh, that has grown to us a place of going towards a, a bit of a resolve. Um, but now with this leaked memo, it's, it's the new space that no one really thought of. It's the unintentional consequence that now the government has to deal with. What's good about this, and that seems odd to say when it comes to this subject matter, but what's good about this is that there's public pressure put on the government that most people have been outraged by it because it sounds ridiculous. It absolutely sounds so ridiculous that it couldn't possibly be in British Columbia, but here we are. The public pressure, I think, is really going to push the government to to do something about it because they can't get away with that. Um, but uh, this is this is tricky. It, I, I've said this 
over and over and over again about the, the BC NDP is that while they have the best intentions, they don't do very well at actually executing and having the foresight of, of thinking about these things. Um, and who would have thought it? But it, it is something that we have to think about in keeping our healthcare workers safe. It, it's again, Kill Salem, like that, the, the thin line on decrim that comes from you're allowed now to possess uh, and carry small amounts of drugs. So you go into the hospital, the nurses can't search you or seize your drugs. You're allowed to have them. But the moment you use them and, they, and nurses say it's happening, you know, behind a curtain or in a bathroom and they am walk into a room and there's a toxic kind of plume of fentanyl lace smoke that they, they walk through and then they, they feel ill. Like that, that line, as Ali mentioned, it kind of no one really anticipated. I don't think that that, that would be where this goes, um, but it's an interesting argument to have. The challenge is that there was this movement that pushed for this policy change and they were successful at getting a provincial government or federal government to do it. But now that movement is not really stepping up to counter, you know, whatever the narratives are or the politicization is or the stigmatization. Like, it, it, and it's falling on government to have to try and rationalize and defend and, you know, change the narrative and all that kind of stuff. So the challenge in this issue and, you know, with the Northern Health Memo, you know, what I read there is there's two issues that are separate, but they're related. One is safety issues within healthcare system and within our hospitals um, towards workers like nurses. And you've heard the nurses unions speak out on this. So there's a safety issue. And then there's also a harm reduction issue. And the challenge is, you know, if you start to um, sort of stigmatize the drug users and the drug use, now you have people who are less likely to access medical services and health services. And there's been lots of reports on this, even among Indigenous people and their experience with the health healthcare system. So there's this line where, on one hand, we don't want to uh, stigmatize people that forces them to then not get access to healthcare. And at the same time, we need to address, and the government needs to address the actual real safety concerns and safety issues that have been identified by lots of different uh, institutions. But, you know, it's it's going to be a continued battle every time some issue, and I think like Ali brought up, whether it's needles in a park or whether it's open drug use, wh whatever it is, there's all these little moments that are turning into these political battles. And there isn't really a, a political movement that is stepping up to the plate to respond to this uh, in a way to justify or explain or, you know, build support for. It. And it's just going to continue to erode public support for decriminalization. Yeah. And you hear it when you talk to the nurses, because they'll say, we support harm reduction, we support decriminalization, we support better access to, to addiction services and safe use during an overdose crisis, but then we walk into a room and w without knowing it, we find ourselves ill because somebody is you know, doing something and they're trying to, to sort through that. It's a very complex and difficult kind of um, you know, intersection between safety and and a drug policy. Jeff, what do you think? Where do you think this is going? So the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about uh, the memo. Uh, I think it was from uh, about a year and a half ago before there were rules in place in, in the hospitals. It, said, it looks like something that was written by an uh, administrator in a hospital who was confused. And uh, right now in BC, smoking, drugs and weapons are, are, are banned in the hospital and some folks are breaking the rules. That's what the minister has said. I think, though, that what what you're seeing here is uh, 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 I hope it's a wake up call for government and the healthcare system. And this is certainly what the the nurses union and nurses who are on the ground are are saying. It's one thing to have aspirations and uh, be an activist and in, in, in support of an ideal. It's another thing to be on the ground in the health system, in the hospitals, making it work. And it's, you know, as Salem said, it's a pilot project. A pilot project is an experiment. Part of an experiment is identifying where things are working well and where things break down and where things break down, fixing them and finding new and better ways to make it work. And hopefully you can. And, you know, we're high on aspiration. But as this is pointing out, uh, 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 we've got to do better on the uh, problem solving and making the system uh, better through this pilot project. I mean, the government has added 300 security guards. That's part of it, but it's a lot more complex than, than, than that. And so mm -hmm. here's a, a, another sign of uh, it's an important experiment and we need to make it work. And if we're going to do that, 
we need to do that on the ground where it's happening and take that seriously instead of when someone raises these issues, shouting at them and calling them names and saying you don't support this. It's up to the advocates uh, and the people who believe in this to, to make it work. And let's, yeah. let's hope that's what happens. And, and it is a, I think the government will have to do something because people like nurses, right? People like nurses, they trust right. nurses. If nurses are coming out saying, we feel unsafe, we support the idea, but we feel unsafe, they're going to have to do something because you can't just dismiss that entire group with sort of a, 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 a government lecture on the principles of what the pilot project is trying to do. Let's move on to the last topic here. Everything is coming up Rustad. That would be Conservative leader John Rustad picking up momentum, a couple new polls while we were gone, talking about solidifying his position as uh, second most popular party right now in, in British Columbia underneath the NDP, but above BC United. He picked up a new candidate, and he lost a candidate. He secured former Chilliwack NDP MLA Gwen O'Mahony for Nanaimo Lanceville this week, but he lost Dr. Stephen Malthouse uh, after it emerged that Malthouse um, was a anti-vaxxer uh, suspended by the uh, doctor's college for his uh, theories. So gain, loss, but overall, you can't argue, I think, with conservative momentum uh, at this point, Jeff. O'Mahony, um, is that good for the conservatives to show that they can recruit from a, a tent like the NDP? Yeah, I, I don't, uh, maybe. Uh, I think uh, Gwen O'Mahony used to be the MLA for Chilliwack, her views on gender issues have evolved since uh, I think she served as an NDP MLA. I think she's in the the right uh, uh, place now. Sad that there's any political uh, party in uh, BC. And so she's uh, kind of rose to prominence in the Nanaimo area uh, by being involved in uh, a group that uh, is going after trans kids. And uh, I know it's a challenging issue and it's different in, for, for folks, but I hope we would agree as a, as a province that bullying vulnerable kids uh, is the wrong uh, thing to do and the wrong thing that we should expect from leaders and people we uh, put in Victoria. And any problems that you've got personally with struggling with uh, issues pales in comparison to the uh, trauma and bullying and uh, harassment and uh, all all the stuff that, that, that trans kids and their families are going through every day, just struggling to try and be themselves and be happy. Um, uh, okay. So, not, so a, not a win. Well, a win in some it's, parts it's, of the conservative base, I guess. There's, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a market for, for this stuff, uh, sadly. And I'm uh, hoping that uh, folks in, in Nanaimo uh, uh, reject it. Um, you know, we're at a bit of a crossroads moment. Uh, for BC, you know, Rustad is 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 recruiting candidates, taking us, you know, down into these culture wars, these Trump style culture wars, you know, uh, focused on uh, meanness and and, and division, uh, you know, trying to get everyone to march to the tune of a of a you know a, a Republican U.S. drum. And I think what you know what I hope voters choose in this next election is is. Uh, kindness and community and focusing on action that address the, the actual real challenges that people are facing, like housing, health care and cost of living, not these uh, um, self-serving uh, culture war stupidity. And mm -hmm. so uh, okay. good luck. Uh, good luck to them. But uh, uh, I, come on, BC, we can do better. Kill Salem, what do you make of more polls that show the conservatives kind of sitting there in second place? Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, Rustad and the BC Conservatives are definitely riding a wave that's being fueled by Pierre Pulvera and the Federal Conservative Party and the cross branding there. Um, you know, I think different scenarios. If there was a if there was a BC Liberal Party and the B, and the Federal Liberals were doing well, you'd probably see an uptick in that sense. If the Federal NDP were doing well and the BC NDP, like, it, it generally happens that way. If one party federally is in the negatives, they get hurt provincially if the brand is the same. So it, it's not surprising that that's happening. I think what is surprising, though, and I think what's probably going to be sh um, what will become more apparent, especially as we head into the next future two elections provincially and federally, is that the demographics of the type of voter um, that we have in Canada who votes conservative or NDP or liberal or BC United, whatever that is, 
I think that some of those demographics are changing. You know, some of the polling is not just that the Conservatives are rising. It's that young people and those under 34 are breaking for the Conservatives. Millennials are breaking for Conservative uh, messaging. And, and, and the Conservatives have done, a, like federally especially, have done a very good job at focusing on economic, populist, um, you know, anti-authoritarian messaging that probably appeals to a, a very um, economically anxious generation. You know, millennials are, are, are hammered um, in terms of income inequality and wages and things like that. So I think that there are there are some tectonic shifts happening under the, the, the floors. And that's going to shift, I think, the dynamics of where the support is and what parties are going to have to do to gain that support. Mm-hmm. And the Conservatives, the BC Conservatives have a wave. Their biggest challenge, of course, is, you know, they need to recruit and retain legitimate candidates to be seen as a legitimate um, heir to the throne. And, and if they become the official opposition, what kind of government will they form eventually if they get to do that? And, Ali, to, to carry that point on, they have to vet them properly. So what do you make of the conservative vetting or lack thereof with the Malthouse case? And then also the, the linkage, the conservative nimbleness to take Pierre Polyev's messaging, talk about themselves as common sense, talk about acts the tax, kind of leap on, fully embrace that confusion, um, seems to be working for him. Yeah, to, so for the first point, um, on the candidate vetting, they're a small operation, the BC Conservatives. They have less than five people that I think work for their office on the political side, up against the BC United that have infrastructure and uh, historical uh, ways of doing things because they've done this a few times. And so my observation is that the BC Conservatives have been able to do more with less. Um, they ha- are actually going to, um, to, to nominate all candidates in every single riding. That's a big feat. They haven't been able to do that since like 1960. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a while for sure. They're going to make mistakes. Every political party is going to be, make mistakes, but they not only do they have an enemy with the NDP, they also have an enemy with BC United. So of course um, they want to make sure those opposing parties are finding things about their candidates so that they can de-legitimize them. And then to your point, Kil- Kil- Salem, um legitimate candidates, like people who are, are going to be strong uh, MLAs for the BC Conservatives. And I think that they've done that. They actually have really good candidates. They're just not getting the exposure that they deserve. These are uh, former city councillors, uh, current mayors in the interior, um, and people with really interesting backgrounds. Okay, great. Thank you to the panel for being here. Thank you for watching. And we'll be back next week with all the latest in BC politics here on Political Capital. Political Capital is brought to you by Uber Canada. Learn more at uber.com slash flexibilityworks.